I also want to let you know that on May 23rd, the fellows will be hosting a virtual intergenerational reading that they've organized to mark the culmination of their fellowship. We'll share details of that reading soon on all of our social media channels. So please follow up on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and we're gonna drop the links to those channels into the chat right now. All right, so first up, uh, Reginald Edmonds is a poet, educator, and community organizer based out of Richmond, California. Their poetry is a map of intersections that describes the world through the viewpoint of a queer, black, and often sad boy light TM. Please welcome Reggie. Hello, hello. Um, can everybody hear me? Perfect. Um, I have just a few, like three poems um, to share with y'all today. Um, the first one is called Coffin Cotton. If all the coffins on the plantation are lined with cotton and all the corpses picked the cotton, then all the fields buried themselves with their gardeners and the blood that watered the roots finally made it back home to comfort the body. When the fields bled out our names, the soft of the casket already was a ghost. What else is better to hold the black body than what grows from its spillage? A child should always bury its parent. If all the cotton seeds birth new plants and all the new plants carry old blood, then a great great grandfather softens himself under a great great grandson. Even in death, it has always been us that holds us. A son buries a father and the cloth of his bloodline is buried with his son. Somewhere in the deep south, I have a coffin full of someone else's blood. Somewhere there is a field of cotton mourning. Okay, and the second poem I have is called Roadkill Examination. Its head is separated from the body in a way that reminds me of a popped black head pimple that I wish would have stayed unpopped instead of bursting across the glass of the unwashed bathroom mirror. What I mean is, ouch, what a terrible way to die. I saw a rat pour out its entrails on 17th Street and I swear God became a broken heart that stopped beating all of a sudden. And not a cardiac arrest kind of peace, but with all the violence of rush hour traffic. The road crumbles and snaps bone and like bone and buzzards scream much like brakes grinding against axle, against wheel, against road, against flesh, and then the road again only a bit slicker than the last time. Nobody knows where death comes from, but everyone sees the trail of viscera left behind and knows exactly where he went. Somewhere in the distance, a pair of headlights will disappear in the fog, but the blood remains, the blood remembers, the blood will appreciate the worms that hold death accountable to the dirt. Decay is a reminder that even the worst things will leave. Even concrete will break apart until it becomes a soft bed of earth. So what if we water the sidewalks with our innards? Who cares if we hollow out our bellies in the streets? Everything that empties itself must be filled again, even if it is with maggots. I could die and birth a thousand flies. I could live and learn to swat them. But there will always be the buzzing, always something trying to make noise be quiet. I am trying to think about anything other than the bodies in the street. I am trying to forget about the dead, or at least remember them in a way that doesn't hurt anymore. But I keep thinking about how the rat's tongue hung limp out of its mouth, like a diet trying to taste something like freedom. Okay. Um, and now I'm gonna leave y'all with something a little bit happier. <laughs> um, this, uh, poem is called Cuervo No Chaser after my favorite drink at the club. The glass, a tiny river of fire trapped inside a city of bodies, moves my hand up to the air between my lips and the liquor spilling over itself, drowns me before the music can, and set aflame. The shyness of my bones tries to liberate itself from the marrow and hops up out of my skin until someone calls the escape of myself from myself dancing. And my mother, a Christian woman, warns me of places like these and bodies like mine and how much of the devil can be found here, but everything is burning and all I see is God floating on top of the glass like a dance floor he created. And if I can find heaven here, then I can move myself to a baseline rapture and everyone can sing the praises of our own names until we are drunk and full of holy 
and empty of everything that brought us here sober. And we can hold each other until the pain leaves the back of our throats. And a boy slips me a drink and I slip him a smile. And the heat of this moment makes me forget myself in his arms and his lips become the first thing I drink that doesn't burn. Thank you. That was beautiful. Um, our next reader is Ali Michael Cannon. Ali Michael Cannon is a poet and dabbler in essays and short stories. His work appears in um, From the Inside Out, Radical Gender Transformation, F to M and Beyond, Queer Jews and Secret Sisters. An educational equity consultant, he lives in Oakland with his wife and teenage son. Please welcome Ali. Thanks so much. Um, can everyone hear me and see me okay? <laughs> awesome. Um, so well, wanna, I just really wanna thank Foglifter for making this possible and really wanna honor the opportunity to be in this experience with Reggie, who's such an incredible writer. And uh, I can't wait to see what he's writing when you're my age, if I'm lucky enough to be around to uh, hear that. So, um, so yeah, um, so I'm gonna read two pieces and uh, this one hopefully maybe can bring us some comfort in this time that we're in. America, land of the lost. This land of the lost, dinosaurs' bones burned in many a forgotten landscape. This move towards extinction, obliteration, pillaging of all kinds. The pain in the lands you left behind, the utter ache, and longing for what was once called home. Migration moving its heart across the planet, birds flying across mountain ice, monarchs traveling up continental divides. The human fabric, the unraveling strings of landscapes threadbare despair. A heritage, an unforgotten, still remembered touch of earth scent, the trill of the tongue lost in your grandmother's mouth her calloused fingers pouring over shillings or shells or molded bread. All the recipes of the world are there, moving over landforms, the unfamiliar barren rock face, the scrapple of morsels, the hard scrabble chaparral, the brush that cannot hide you. Calling out into the wilderness, the familiar night sounds, Great horned owl, echo locating micro bats, the rivulet that you follow to draw water, to bathe tenderly your small son's fragile head. And the next piece I'm gonna read is um, basically uh, a piece that uh, I wrote since I've been in this fellowship and um, I'm grateful for the inspiration to write. And I also want to just acknowledge that on this call are people in my extended family who have different viewpoints and may or may not have ever been part of a queer literary event and how proud I am to be in a family like my wife's extended family. This poem is called Aunt Connie. It starts with a, a Kate Bush quote. Be running up that road, be running up that hill, if only I could make a deal with God, no problems. We were sitting at your round table in your apartment on Piedmont Avenue in Oakland, the place we fell in love. I remember how you wailed, full mouth, wailing like those women who grieve children killed in war on roadsides, unending. No female part of me ever wailed that loud, never could, not like that. We sat at your kitchen table. The loud wailing should have broken the table in half. You told me how your aunt shot herself. She shot herself. It was so awful. They found her on the floor of her apartment days after she died. The rotting smell of her by a neighbor. It was so awful. Aunt Connie, your mother's sister, the wild and free one the sober one, the one who took you shopping to buy clothes your mother couldn't have imagined, the free one, the wild one, the one your brother still lights candles to, to in his misery. One of her paintings hangs in our house. It's always getting tilted. I think she moves it. 
her spirit of unrest, the painting makes me uncomfortable. Maybe I hear you wailing when I go to write it. The lines like Jackson Pollock, frayed and moving, green and brown and light dancing. She got into Santeria. She lost herself. Perhaps the voices told her to pick up the gun, or maybe she couldn't make them stop. Your mother's cousin, he went and cleaned the apartment, identified the body. It was a male relative, right thing to do. He's probably never let out his wail. How could he? Silences in your family, that mug of blue china you had to drink, New England proper, always to ha having to fit in with some imagined Kennedy you might meet. Walking down the streets of Hyannis in your muted colors, navy and maroon and black. It was your palette when I met you, still coloring within the lines, never allowed out of the box. The secrets of your family held in like a cage. I can still hear you wailing, your voice opened up. We were sitting at your kitchen table, small and round, pushed into the ceiling like a carnival funhouse twirling, screaming, not a ride. Aunt Connie was laid to rest that day, or maybe let out of her own box to dance around, the shores of Lauderdale by the sea and Ocean Ridge, searching for her sister, searching for herself, her wildness, her free. Thank you. Um, next, we're gonna welcome Ashia uh, uh, Ajani. Ashia Ajani is a, black, a queer black storyteller from Denver, Colorado, Queen City of the Plains. Her work confronts Black environmental imaginaries, exploring the legacies of trauma and resistance within the diaspora. She has been published in Atlas and Alice magazine, Sage magazine, and Hopper Literary magazine, among others. She released her first chapbook, We Bleed Like Mango, in October 2017. Please welcome her. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Amazing. Um, I feel so very blessed to be in this space. Um, I, I was looking forward to this launch party so, 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 so much. I'm very new to the Bay, um, and I'm glad that we could have it in this capacity, and it's great to see everyone's face and to share community with everything going on right now. Um, so thank you all so much. Um, I don't know why. I'm, like, nervous now. I'm going <laughs> to just read my poem. I didn't intentionally spurn the forest. Rather, it became another question of Southern belonging I didn't have the patience to unravel. Must have been when the little white kids next door asked if we wanted to play cowboys and Indians, and all I could think about was the split in my conquered DNA that stood on both ends of the chastening rod. Or maybe when a man held a shotgun to the back of my mentor's head while we were out in the field asked, whose land you think you on, boy? Neither of ours. We just learned to love it because it was the only thing that granted us some semblance of peace. My mentor says he has encountered poisonous snakes in the Panamanian jungle, and this scared him less than doing research in the deep south. Snakes are usually more frightened by you than you are of them. Same goes for white folks, but Lord, how I prefer a fang to those trigger fingers. I didn't intentionally spurn the darkness until they claimed ownership of that which once sheltered us. When all that was hunt and run soaked my endings in bloodlust through this violent cat and mouse condition, the inherent trickery of my blood begged me to stay grounded when all I could imagine in flight. The voices in these woodlands are alive and they carry a vengeance. And maybe this is why white people fear the dark and what it holds. We marvel at its ability to hold, call it semantics, a cultural linguistic loophole, our right to something. Abuela weaves together sweet tales about the backwoods that were once hers, long after the plantation manifestation made a mockery of her inheritance. The trees held their secrets with rope and flame, but I can't help but envision my Abuela laughing, running not from any one thing, but towards the witching hour our foremothers once found refuge in. Mississippi is a graveyard of all my kin's wildest ambitions. We play pretended Americanness until it felt real enough to sink into until it didn't defend us from the light, until the superfund affliction reminded us of the well-earned savagery in our marrow. I flee from what my ancients trusted, and isn't that the most heart-wrenching betrayal of my blood? To deny myself access to the blackest parts of this earth, 
My great, great, great grandmother's phantom footsteps litter the ground like dead leaves, and isn't that what this lineage always returns to? This ill understood trauma of existing in between shadow and soul. Tell me, what is the difference between haunting and protecting a place? The wounds down here are older than the flesh that displaced them, but the twilight reminds us that we could feel whole yet. Black people in the South breathe life into dark and call it home. Black as the soil that birthed bright cotton. Uh, black as the soil that birthed bright cotton. This Mississippi Delta madness, home. This wild, expansive blackness, home. Mississippi, baby, on my good days, I imagine you soft and lazy, draped in all that green, all that darkness, all that unloved black. Thank you guys so much. Um, I am going to put my uh, social media info in the chat if anybody wants to follow and like see um, what I'm up to. Um, would love to share community and space and exchange poetry and writing um, with all of y'all. Thank y'all for listening. I appreciate it. <laughs> that was amazing. I should read all the, everyone was just writing so many things. <laughs> um, so next is Vanita Blackburn. Uh, Vanita Blackburn has appeared in Electric Literature, Virginia Quarterly Review, Paris Review, American Short Fiction, and others. She received the Prairie Schooner Book Prize for Fiction, which resulted in the publication of her collection of short stories, Black Jesus and other superheroes in 2017. In 2018, she earned a place as a finalist for the Penn Brigham Award for Debut Fiction, finalist for the NYPL Young Lions Award, and recipient of the Penn America Los Angeles Literary Prize in Fiction. Her hometown is Compton, California, and she is an assistant professor of creative writing at California State University, Fresno. Please welcome Vanita. Hello, everyone. Sound good? Okay, good. Okay, thank you for inviting me to read and share this space, and all the readers have been terrific. You know, my heart's going from the rhythm from the last one. It's amazing. So I'm going to read the title story of my next collection that comes out in fall of 2021, and it's called How to Wrestle a Girl. Okay. Option one, forfeit. Can't lose if you don't play, though it is technically losing. For a teenage boy in America, there is little status in defeating a girl or being defeated by one. Claim a faith-based reason for not participating, which everyone interprets as not wanting to risk an erection. Feel righteous and horny. Gradually lose devotion to the sport and eventually your God. Option two, have nothing to prove. Feel secure in your skill and never underestimate hers. She is your equal in weight and height, and you are difficult to tell apart from high up in the bleachers. Be awake, be cautious. Forget your own name because it doesn't matter in the moment. There are only two positions, top and bottom. Begin in neutral with a smile. Use one of the four basic grips in wrestling, the butterfly, wrist over wrist, elbows close to the ribs. Use your torso strength to maneuver her to the ground. You are now the top. It was easy because she was thinking about another face a body full of hope with bruises and neck acne and how nice it is to be close to her. She was thinking about tomorrow, not about your shoes squeaking in a lunge forward. Continue like this until you are named winner or not. Option three, have something to prove as well as a pre-programmed disregard for women, especially lesbians. Assume she is a lesbian. Hate her body, her hair, and the color of her uniform. Green is stupid. With a simple attack, you are now at the top. Bean. Believe you have won and leave yourself vulnerable. Notice your opponent slip out from under you. Feel embarrassed as if you've dropped something valuable like your pants and underwear. She binds you via a gable grip, monkey grip, hand over fist to secure you in an arm lock. Everyone is looking at you, roll around with what looks like yourself. It is unclear who was the boy and who was the girl and people want to see what you will become so they can call the winner by name. Remember that girls have lighter bones and wear their weight and muscle and fat. Headbutt the girl with your heavy skull and hope the ref doesn't see, hope everyone else does. Watch her wince, smile or try, but fail to remember how. Use the S grip, curled fingers only, which requires strength in the knuckles to circle her body while it is hurting. Smell her and yourself, indistinguishable as two lit matches. Lift up as she straightens with hands and feet on the ground like a tent. Slap her arms till they welt. Will them to release their grip before the timer runs out and you are named. Notice the sides of the areolas through her uniform as you squeeze your forearms around her ribs. 
Feel the tiny soft ridges. Forget how to get hard. Forget your own name. Be flipped to the bottom position. Land hard on your right elbow. Find yourself seized by the girl in a ball and socket grip, hand over fist. Great for chokeholds and not great for you. Because of the pain in her head, she is not thinking about tomorrow. Only this hour in your throat and how soft it is and how it yields so easily under her bones. At the whistle, breathe again as the rep ends the match to spare you the act of surrendering and or unconsciousness. Know your name again. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you, guys. That's beautiful. Oh my gosh, love it. And someone said in the chat, how do they buy it? Um, Chad, can you drop again the link to the journal um, if you have a chance into the chat? Um, you can buy it and subscribe and read that story again at your leisure. Um, okay, so uh, Timothy E. Bradley is a Boston-based fiction writer whose work explores queer experience, history, and imagination. He's working on a, co a collection of short stories and his first novel. Please welcome him. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, thank you, Foglifter, for putting this together. I should say, can everyone hear me? Yes? Awesome. Um, and thank you to all the readers who are here tonight. It's awesome to hear your work. I just got uh, my copy in the, in the mail today that I'm reading from, and I can't wait to read all of it. Um, I'm reading from a short story in the issue called Autocorrect, which is a queer sci-fi tale about a guy who gets an autocorrect implanted in him, like an upgrade, so that he can speak better, and what happens when it breaks down. I'm just gonna read the first couple sections and you'll have to read the rest. Those first days, fresh tuned, fresh in my skin, Words so simple, pleasures of phrase, how easy I spoke then. I walked along the river and pulled a rose from my throat. The flower emerged whole, petals cupped by calyx, saliva stretching from my lips. The bud spilled into my hands. I offered it to my loved one beside me, his downward glance, his palm extended. Red blossoms passing between hands, sometimes orange, purple, pink. This was our exchange. Among the trees and a few gliding birds, I watched my mouth open skyward, the flower head fall between his lips. Oop, my larynx, my utterance, entering, gone. Where is he now? Would he even recognize my voice? They slit a man's throat the other day a few blocks from where I sleep. He stumbled out of a listening booth and started berating passers-by, pointing all directions, wrench, wrench, wrench. I felt for him. Nothing like that has happened in a while. Was it worth it? Were his urges like mine? I said to myself, don't make a fool of yourself, Thomas, a pool of yourself. No one wants to hear you anymore but I am afraid. The tremors are back. They graze my neck. I slap them out. It used to work. Now sometimes they charge me from the pelvis up, furious for escape, but there is nowhere for them to go. They ride me and leave me. Giddy up, you convalescent. I used to say things right. The day I was fired, the boss approached my station. He said, we can't have sounds like that entering the cones. What? Some shard fell out of me. It was all I could say. It will disturb the people, he said, undermine everything we are doing. As if I didn't know the privilege and responsibility of the cones. I glanced up and down my row of colleagues ashamed. Why did he have to make such a scene? It was under control, I thought. I had taken precautions, corrective measures. A, E, I, O, U? No. But seal off his cone. Allow me to escort you. His set, your sacrifice will suffice. That night, I called home for a comforting tone. Some mother to son, mother tongue, you know? Someone, sometimes one person is all you need. But between what I said and what she heard, my words warped and wobbled. What's that sound, my mother said. I cleared my throat and tried again. 
are you okay? Did something happen? I'm fine. Everything's fine. I just, Thomas, her voice, a sharp whisper. What did you do? You sound like one of those claws. I don't know what happened next. There is that moment before the stone tumbles past the cliff's edge and you think I should grab it, but it's too late. It vanishes into the vista with your arms stretched out and the wind hissing and you might as well be the stone because it was all you ever had. This does not reflect on you, mom, I said. I will get my delivery under control. My numbers have been up. They will rehire me. I might not be able to send home money for a while, but stop it, Thomas, she said. You're croaking. It hurts. It's rude. Call back when I can understand you. Thank you. Wow, I love that. I love that story. <laughs> um, next up, we have Cassie Garrison. Uh, Cassie Garrison has work published or forthcoming in Washington Square Review, River Six, Nimrod International, Salamander, and more, and is currently a poetry reader for one of my favorite journals, the Adroit Journal. Please welcome Cassie. Are you there, Cassie? Yeah, I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Gotcha. Sorry. <laughs> oh, wait, can you? Oh, there it is. Okay. I get it. <laughs> All right. So thanks for putting this together. It's been super fun to pretend to be at a poetry reading in my room, or be at a poetry reading in my room, I guess. Um, I just have three newer poems to read that I'm still kind of working on, but are, are definitely close to where they're gonna be. The first one is called Another Freight Passes the Puget Sound. Uh, and it's, the sound is like, I think it's a bay in Seattle. I should know if it's a bay, but I just moved here like eight months ago, so I don't know. Um, my shins pendulum through the iron lattice of an overpass. Ash falls from my mouth, from my arm hair, from my clothes. Below, the leviathan of a train heaves her steel torso around this segment of her orbit, rearranges each shell shard and tinted dip of glass in the war hall of the bay. The bridge mutters, vibrates away her rigidity for a moment. I wait for the last boxcar to tip over the cliff of the horizon undisclose its copper pupil like a planet swallowed by daybreak. O oh Mars, O oh deity of destruction, you with so many names, bring in your parting an ecstatic rage, a devastating clarity. Allow me to rasp a hymn for you, to rattle a prayer. How sweet it must be to be a man reddened by desire, how sweet to be a god unbridled by the weapon of himself. Um, and the next two poems are part of a series of sonnets. Um, and they're all kind of connected, but not really in order yet. And they don't really have names other than numbers. So this one is currently number three. And it references this biblical story of a uh, legion who's like, a guy who is um, singing and dancing in a graveyard and is one of the first like attempted uh, cures for madness that the Bible describes. A uh, patch of orange torn into the evening. Are you my lover? Are you a thread of darkness woven into the whirlwind of the night? Every time I break, I find myself in a graveyard Dancing with the stones, I find myself a grasp of blades crowding the mouth of a hen. Here is my illness splayed on the page, unshakable as a batch of flames caught in the heaving throat of a dog. I found my way here and have to say, 2,000 pigs spewed out of me, and still I wrote this, and still I wrote. All right, and my last one is called Five, uh, Reality. Even when I'm awake, I can't outwit you. You know the softest tissue of my brain, 
like a rat knows the inner hemisphere of a piece of bread. You know that a stone can make an anchor of a body, can be a meteor stolen from orbit, then drowned in a pocket. Plath, wolf, sexton, I too can strike a flower ill just by saying in just by saying its name. This is how it feels to be a body broken into animals, once trapped in the chest of a hound with his back to the train, once an ox whose mouth runs over with foam, and once a thousand wasps humming manic against the interior of their hive. They swarm, then rest, then swarm again. Thanks. Those are my poems. <laughs> Wow. Um, so next, um, we're going to have Muriel Young. Muriel is the author of Bone Confetti, the winner of the 2015 Naomi Press Book Award. She's the poetry co-editor of Apogee Journal, as well as the co-host of the Blood Jet Writing Hour podcast with Raquel Cruz and M.T. Vallarta. Currently, she's a dorm sife fellow in creative writing and literature at the University of Southern California. Thank you, Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you to everyone at Foglifter, um, folks who are doing the closed captioning for this, um, and to Dan Lau for inviting me to share work with you all. Um, I just moved to the, I just moved to Oakland, um, so I'm excited that this is my first reading um, uh, since moving to Oakland. So I'm excited to share space with you all. Um, I'm just going to be reading one poem today that um, was published in this beautiful journal right here. Um, this one um, for the folks who are doing closed captioning is um, the one I sent in. Um, it's the first line is suppose it is easy to believe. Um, oh, and this is uh, actually this poem will be appearing in um, a second poetry collection that will be published through Night Boat. Uh, in 2021, entitled Imagine Us the Swarm. Um, uh, so this is from a series uh, called uh, When I Imagine All the Possibilities of the Swarm. Suppose it is easy to believe. Every spiral landing leaves a fossilized mark, the hard air pushing against its wings, having shape, texture, and fold. Easy to swallow what we cannot see, what the barriers of flesh cannot know, the coarseness of evidence, the fabric of my hive. There would be no question of feathers, their lightness accruing iron, no animal testifying to the grave. When I bleed, I bleed. The forest rushes to bind the body red to me. Easy to make amends out of water, the fish leap from the foam, and this can be a victory too. Though I once placed too much faith in brute and ardor, it is softness that touches me. Even in the absence of love, I kneel before the altar of its loss, my belief lit by candle alone. I have this belief in the afterlife of many tender objects, the persistence of their kin, belief that though the truth pockets holes, I peer through blinds and the kite of it is waiting there with tricolored bells. There is proof enough for you and me. There would never be any need for proof again. When I say, I believe you, I mean this, the kite, the colors, the clarity of bells. Thank you. Love that. You have such a beautiful ending. People are saying in the chat, they love the clarity of bells. Uh, beautiful. This journal issue is so good. You're all so great. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, next, um, Whitney Porter. Uh, Whitney Porter's work has appeared in Ping Pong Literary Magazine, Battered Suitcase, MetaZen, and Queer Tea Magazine. She's a 2016 Lambda Literary Fellow and is currently a staff reader for Epiphany Magazine. Originally from Houston, Texas, she now calls Brooklyn, New York her home. She holds a BA in journalism from Empire State College, SUNY. Please welcome her. Hi everyone, um, it's awesome to be here and uh, thank you to Bob Lister for arranging this. Um, I'm just going to be reading from my short story that I uh, published in Bob Lifter called Blue Slush. 
the only thing you need to know, she's writing in an anger uh, journal, uh, which is like a diary. Um, it's not explained why she's writing an anger, anger book, but uh, you will find out if you read the entire story. So uh, something to look forward to. Dear Anger Book, at first as the F train rumbled between Bergen and Smith Street, I pretended not to notice the teenage girls across the way, staring, giggling, making low comments that I couldn't quite make out. I could guess what was being said to, about me in fierce hot whispers between them. I didn't need be, to be told I was different, yet it was often perplexing to me how often people felt the need to tell me so, that I looked like the kind of woman that would like to sleep with other women. As if these pearls of wisdom given out by total strangers had never been screamed out at me in their many iterations in various hallways in junior high, high school, and college. Hollered from highways, expressways, pedestrian passageways, dirt roads, commuter roads, feeder roads, cracked sidewalks, and nature trails. Catawalled from economy cars, moving pickup trucks, sedans, U-Hauls, bicycles, big wheels, and mobility scooters. As if I was completely unaware of my aversion to Dick all this time, and that upon the slur-filled shouts, whispers and murmurs. I should feel the sting of the insult as if it was an insult, as if wanting to fuck a woman was a bad thing and not the best thing ever. Dyke, one of them cracked into her breath, her gaze hidden behind a curtain of greasy black bangs, her face so pale she looked practically translucent, save for the rosy clusters of acne across her cheeks. It was before 2 p.m. Tuesday on a cold January day, I was sitting in an empty train car, save for the teenagers, heading home from a particularly grueling waitering shift at my corporate dining room job in lower Manhattan. I was still wearing my polyester tux underneath my parka, a stain of goose pate encrusted on the lapel. The train had just come out of the tunnel and we were now above ground. Winter had layered New York City's littered streets with a beautiful sheet of white. I love these times in New York, when it looked to me like a beautiful and immaculate baby just before christening, white gowned and serene, clean and quiet, angelic and swaddled, all of its shit tucked away in a gleaming white diaper of snow. But soon my reverie was interrupted. I sniffed at something that smelled like strawberries, but was not strawberries, a shopping mall kiosk aberration of strawberry. Yo, I love this shit, one of the teenagers said between moments of spritzing strawberry-scented toxins in the air and giggling rapidly at things on their phone, the teenagers intermittently continued to discuss the overwhelming probability of my gayness. While passing around a blue, blue slush, like a blue slushy, like a bong at a rave. I mean, she's like wearing a suit. I have one question in your book. Who drinks a slushy in the middle of winter? I am not intolerant to stupid people. I have many acquaintances and family that are stupid, and I manage to talk to them and engage with them as if they are real people. I have even been able to love stupid people, love them as if they were smart. In fact, loving them so much that I did not realize they were stupid until I did not love them anymore. But sitting there on that bone chilling afternoon, what came to my mind looking at these young girls sipping, these young girls, sipping on a frozen beverage while passing the snow-capped wasteland of the Gowanus, was the question, had someone loved these stupid girls the way I had loved stupid girls in the past? Not calling out stupid for what it was, therefore being complicit in the stupid? As the train crossed over the Gowanus Canal, I stared down at the huddled gray warehouses, the lumps of sand looking like enormous white sand castles next to ice-dusted dump trucks and cement mixers, all set along the icy brown waters of the Gowanus. How miserable they all looked, stuck out in the cold, stranded, tinny structures born into misery. Then I looked at these girls as they, are, they sat squeezed together, rumpled in their winter layers, sipping on their frozen blue beverage. The girl with the greasy black bangs took a strenuous sip of slushy, pulled the cup back, and held her head. Why is this so cold? I stared on valiantly, trying to not make eye contact, but so wanting to make eye contact, to see what her face looked like when she said stupid things to stare into her pale, transparent head, view her walnut-sized brain as she fathomed out why was ice so cold, 
the ponderous and helpless expressions, the world, such a perplexing and confusing place. What is it with physics? Why are lit matches hot? Why is a waiter's tip of five pennies at the bottom of a half-eaten milkshake sticky? Why do eggs thrown onto a car's surface ruin the paint job? Why do large bricks of cement drop from an overpass onto oncoming traffic just for fun? have the weight and capacity to kill people? Why are human beings between the ages of 13 and 18 such, so, such total sociopathic shits, the mysteries of the universe? I mean, what the fuck, said the greasy fan girl, no doubt believing she had given herself an icy embolism. She pulled her hair away from her eyes and I saw they were brown and earnest. A stream of tears ran roughshod down her pimply face. She looked so young and helpless that I almost felt sorry for her. Almost. Thank you. <laughs> I need to stop laughing. I feel like <laughs> I'm going to uh, cry. Oh my gosh, amazingly hilarious. Um, so next uh, we have Gia Shakur. Gia Shakur is a writer and visual artist based in Harlem, New York. Her work has been featured in Sinister Wisdom, Joint Literary Magazine, Broadkill Review, and Grunge Cake. She is an inaugural graduate fellow of the Watering Hole and an alumnus of Winter Tangerine and Houston Wright, or sorry, Hurston Wright Foundation. She loves cats, sushi, and weighted blankets. Please welcome Gia. Hi, how are you doing? <clears throat> Um, I'm going to read uh, a couple of pieces from something that I think is that might be a manuscript. <laughs> okay. Um, yeast. Story of my father. My aunt told me she can still remember a free backhand christened with a jagged gold hoop. My mom's cheek split open, painted plum and ivy, a virgin mango beside her nose. He waved a machete over her head, whipped the dewy air of our apartment, two black hammocks under her eyes. She remembers her brother bathing his tongue in yeast, praying with a metal flag and swollen hands. Damaged Girl Club, Fashina Marie. We're going to the sand today to give ocean fissure, molasses, grouse, and silver. Our ceremony shrouds made of velvet, chaos, and devil shoe string. We have stained our lips mausoleum pink. Say her name not. We make a fiscal dance and sing, then sing a testimony of bone and cheek. Our devolution is crisp, streaming from our ears and necks. We give ourselves to the drum. The prayer was a mud hole clinging to the nest of our mouths. All right, hold on, because I have like a little like thing going on here and it's, it's like drawing attention. <laughs> from the screen, my bad, y'all. It's like a little thing going on there. Um, okay, I have uh, one more, and this is the poem that appears in Fog Lifter, which is such a beautiful journal from what I see, and I can't wait until USPS delivers it in my hands because it is such a gorgeous cover, and all of my friends love it. Okay, um, this is called Daughter Shore. Oh, slight adjustment, slight adjustment. Daughters of hot and tot, iron imports from the horn's mouth, now even a daughter called monk. Some now gathered in church rolls, lined up at bus stops at five in the morning, scrubs and crocs the color of hyssop. 
dispensing bandages to humanity. Still a happy head monkey thought. Big city rube, small time hussy slave to pews. Holy diction, carrying the hush of men. Blowback of children whose fathers ran into stars. Nightlife heifer bar back. Bar exam working overnight. Writhing pastel and cutter hats. Number running, running, gunning. Pushed a lover down those stairs. Daughters preparing the limbs of children, paramours, the limbs they shift. Them gone, the ones they flatten their face into welcome mats, growing madness in their wombs, and the image of Black Madonna, Venus, buoyant ass, long dripping nipples, wombs abandoned on tables, anatomical prototype police, daughters of new, no daughters who died calling cock church him. Listen them praying blues into the mic, shake dancing under the carnival lights. Daughters of Shango and Obatala, God bless the daughters who throw dice, folding hair into barrettes, hand game, hand clapping champs. Daughters who left with some of their teeth in the edge of their man's knuckles. Daughters with teeth steeped in canyon. Daughters with jars, pots, and cow tongues, hands seasoned in clay and chalk. Daughters soapbox seed. Junebug and monk come to rise the stung flower. Watch them gather at the water and eat. Watch them gather at the water and eat. Watch them gather at the water and eat. Thank you so much um, for giving me space uh, to read my quarantine poems and my poems about mermaids and dead people. Love y'all, Foglifter. So oh, beautiful. I love that one so much and I love hearing new things. It's so cool that we're getting to hear all the new things you all are working on too. That's really special and makes me feel less like I'm stuck in my house for the past month. Um, so next uh, we're going to have Damani Thomas. Damani is a lover of Outcast, Buffy the Vampire Slayer enthusiast, and a horror film fanatic. In 2017 and 2018 he was also a member of the UC Berkeley's national poetry team earning the Best Writing as a Team Award in 2018. He is also a Show, a show Us Your Spines 2020 Artist in Residence. His writing, is, his, his writing often meditates, sorry, on resurrection, music, Black queer living, being a nerd, and writing the future. Their work can be found in Base Journal, The Kruvarov, I can't say that right, Kruvarov, I think maybe, uh, Mary, The Journal of New Writing, or in his self-published chat book, Talk About Me and Other Ways I Stay Alive. Please welcome to money. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? OK. OK, thank you. Um, so first off, thank you, Foglifter, for like having me read today. Uh, shout out to everyone else that's been listening and also sharing the work. Um, so this new poem I wrote on the first day of 30 for 30. I don't know if other people are attempting that and failing, succeeding. Um, so yeah, uh, this opens with a quote. I still fear those who enter rooms cloaked in silent power and while we speak, plan their retaliations. Surveillance is not seeing, it is the quiet planning of prisons. Joan Nestle. Beginning. An internet search says the origins of surveillance lead back to wiretapping in the 1800s. A broker sells overheard information to stock traders to earn a profit. If Google bothered to do its research, it'd know. Before this, there was water. There were people with no names, just documents with shapes and sizes. Tangent. What if I told you all, all surveillance was sexual? All of it. Just one man's way of knowing what another man kept behind his front door. A history of being too afraid to ask your neighbor for sugar. Satellites. An all-seeing eye tells us something. Voyeurism is a kink. Borders. Segment ground and body and distribute accordingly. Ain't no fun if the homies can't get none. Says some colonizer lost at sea. Or man who discovers body of water and insists it be shared. Or porn scene in which we did not agree on the conditions, but my wallet begs to be full on the way home. Phone cameras have saved my life and endangered it. There is no pretty way to say a, a racist cop has my nudes and uses them for his pleasure. A racist knows my full name and says it in a guillotine tone. Voyeurism is a kink. 
everything you know is everything you know and you can exploit that. When intimacy becomes a surveillance technology, everything is Giovanni's room. Surveillance, surveil, serve, meaning to confuse someone. Homonym being serve, as in what purpose does this weapon have? I've never known a peaceful origin story for a wiretapped phone, infrared binocular at dusk, military base in the name of safety. The question, what if surveillance is just to capture something free, tangent? All I have in my lonely is sadness's distant cousin in love songs, tangent. Surveil, keep a person or place under surveillance as in quarantine, as in lab rat experiment, as in Foucault's theory on prisons. In the right lighting, a dance floor can contain two. Some degree removed immigrant finds refuge in movement. I did not te if I did not teach myself to dance, I would not be alive. I close my eyes and spiral in between shadows. What I imagine is what I imagine and nothing else. Here we read flesh. I don't care about your name. The important question is, do you know this song? What memory brought you here? Of course, I know this one by heart. Let me teach you an easy dance. Dissociation in three steps. Step, ball, change. Halfway through and I have not said it. When I talk about assault, I dance around the issue. I'm realizing that every safe haven I've been in since has had at least one person trying to Little Red Riding Hood their way into me. I didn't know they made wolf ghillie suits for the club until I saw it. How to lace a conversation with intimacy. Innuendo, just one repressed memory away from a safe word trigger. When fear bleeds itself into your poems, stitch it up, not to keep it alive, but to interrogate. Figure out how did it end up here. Help me find a word that calls for two mouths. Separate the bodies I am theorizing, African, American, Black, queer, father's son, predator's prey. I need a hyphen the size of an ocean to make all my unfamiliar relationships true. I become envious of people that can call dying a transition. I think I'll take that. Poem transitions into call for help. And if, only if, it was that already, then call for help transitions into a sick geometry. I am still dancing, and I've carved nothing but stop signs in the carpets. Maybe this is just about how I don't trust men or women or any gender with a racial preference. Hence that no, no dances, only control. I, I mean to say, I bring every tangent with me. I don't know how to tell someone this memory can't resurface again. I need you to leave and take every remnant of a remnant with you. Wow. Do you have another one? Reading that one? Yeah, just that one. Thank you. That was so good. Oh my God. I mean, like, I we knew you were all amazing, but you're so amazing. How are you this amazing? Wow. Okay, so I'm gonna introduce our last reader. I'm this is kind of like the best been the best part of my weekend. And just first wanna say how much I appreciate all of you. Um, and then I'll probably say it some more after this. <laughs> Uh, so, Adi Sai is a biracial, queer, non-binary artist and writer, and the author of the queer Asian young adult novel, Dear Twin. Adi holds an MFA in poetry from Warren Wilson College and a PhD in dance from Texas Women's University. She's a nonfiction editor at The Grief Diaries, senior associate editor in poetry at Flexible Persona, and associate fiction editor at Anomaly. Please welcome Adi. Hello. <clears throat> Thank you so much for having me. I'm not really sure how I'm going to follow that, but uh, I'll try. <laughs> uh, I just want to thank Foglifter. Foglifter's been a favorite journal of mine for a long time. And I also want to thank Dan Lau for having me share work. I'm very excited about being an issue. I'm actually going to read um, a short piece about the jean jacket that I'm wearing, um, which you can't really see, but it's covered with I think the last time I counted, um, 77 lapel pins. And so I wrote this little piece for um, an anthology that came out last month, edited by Megan Volpert called Closet Cases, Queers on What We Wear. So I just wanna read from that, okay. In praise of the bedazzled denim jacket. One, the staple of all staples, 
the denim jacket bedazzled with buttons, patches, or in my case, the accessory that trumps all others, the lapel pin, too. I was drawn to the denim jacket on its own on one cold November afternoon, three. I don't have the story other queers have of their style evolution. I didn't have a father that let me run around the front lawn in my underwear and my favorite yellow rain boots. In fact, there was one morning I did indeed want to wear those same boots on a hot spring day. My father was a single parent, an immigrant, who felt it an impracticality, wearing an article of clothing purely for the look and feel of it. I hid under the bed, but eventually I would be forced to come out and wear again whatever it was he had deemed appropriate for both me and my twin to wear in unison. Four, when my father wanted to dress us as tomboys, we dressed as tomboys. When my father wanted us to wear frilly dresses in front of company, we did. Five, there are no photos I can point to to say there she is, desperate to come out. Six, I knew my skin tingled when I saw Whitney prance through a paint splattered house on MTV. I knew I wanted to be seen by Janet in her Rhythm Nation uniform. Seven, but if you were to study me, I looked like a regular old straight biracial Asian girl. Eight, before I came out, long dark hair, A-line skirts, red lipstick, Mary Jane, Mary Jane pumps. After I came out, neon eyeliner, bow ties, neckties, Oxfords, less skirts, and a denim jacket gradually inking its flesh with lapel pins. Nine, number 13 on auto, straddle, on, on auto straddles, 31 iconic L word outfits ranked by incandescence. Buttons, baby. There's Shane, her usual shade of casual forlorn, a jean jacket studded with buttons. Even I, in my DIY tattoo jacket, had queered myself without realizing it. 10, this jacket is my signature brand, my identifying article, my second skin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abby. Um, so that is us for tonight. I know it seems ridiculous that it's over because it was so much fun. Um, <laughs> but um, we just really want to say how much we appreciate you all for being here. I think obviously this is an incredible issue of the magazine. All the readers were amazing. Um, I just, I just really, um, yeah, I feel very, excited that something lovely is happening in this really hard time. So thank you all for, for being here and being part of that loveliness. Um, yeah, and this will be, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, this video will be archived on YouTube with captions. Um, so if you know people that wanted to attend but they didn't get to, um, you'll be able to direct them to that. I and mean, we'll share that with you um, later. Okay, I guess that's us <laughs> and it. <laughs> um, Good night, everyone, and and thank you. And join us. Uh, do remember to join us. Um, follow us on the the instant. Um, sorry, follow us on social media. Come to our next reading. We're gonna have an, a couple coming up, and uh, we'll see you all then. All right. Bye.